Okay, well, I will get started with our introduction today for this event, and we're so excited to have you here. Again, this is a Lab to Table event sponsored by the School of Medicine Basic Sciences here at Vanderbilt about coffee where science meets SIPS. My name is Aaron Conley. I am the Director of External Affairs and Partnerships for the School of Medicine Basic Sciences and have been a coffee enthusiast for most of my adult life and excited to moderate this conversation today. So coffee is one of the most sought after commodities in the world, and it's a global industry with more than $495 billion a year in sales. It's been around for centuries, and some scholars even credit coffee for fueling the ideas of the Enlightenment. And today, coffee is very versatile. It's found in coffee shops and offices and homes and stores, and about 75% of Americans drink coffee every day, enjoying a wide variety of, of different ways to, to drink it. But what does science say about coffee and its health benefits? And how does coffee affect individuals and communities? What is research uh, showing and how is it changing the way we view coffee, drink coffee and think about coffee? Uh, so for a little bit of housekeeping today, uh, you can place your questions in the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. We did receive a lot of questions through registration and we'll try to answer as many as we can towards the end of this discussion. And today we're very excited to have with us leaders in the coffee uh, industry and coffee research. And so I'm pleased to turn it over uh, to Ted and Bartholomew to start with their introductions. And they're also going to talk about uh, at the end of that, what their favorite way to drink coffee or what their favorite coffee order is. So Ted and Bartholomew, I'll turn it over to you. Super. You got it, man. Yeah, you want me to go first? Yeah, All right. Uh, thanks so much, Aaron. We're really excited to be here. Uh, my name's Ted Fisher. I'm a cultural anthropologist, and I've been researching coffee for about the last uh, 10 or 15 years. I've got a new book out uh, called Making Better Coffee. Uh, and so I have, uh, that's, that's my role in the coffee world. I first started drinking coffee seriously when I was in graduate school at New Orleans. And there was a PJ's coffee shop on Magazine Street with this wonderful little back patio. And I would sit there all day and all night, sipping my coffee and watching the world go by. And so when I think of my comfort spot of drinking coffee, as, as Aaron asked us, I, I think back to those early days of PJs in New Orleans. So, yeah, I'm a big fan of the book. You're right, by the way. It's, it's very, very inspirational. My name is Bartholomew Jones. I'm an educator. I'm an MC, and I'm a coffee nerd from Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, my wife and I, Renata Henderson, started an educational movement built on reclaiming the Black history of coffee and reimagining what a Black future can look like. Uh, particularly through the lens of hip hop. And uh, yeah, I got into coffee like a lot of folks did uh, from church. That was kind of like the only beverage, the only excuse to get out of the sanctuary. And uh, I used to, when I became a junior deacon, I used to like take a little powdery cream yeah. and sugar, a couple of drinks, a couple of drops of coffee and mix it up. I call it a <laughs> trappuccino, you know what I mean? So that was my drink of choice as a kid. And then eventually in college, I got into third wave coffee. So at the moment, my beverage of choice is generally sipping on something from the African diaspora, whether that's an Ethiopian. Generally, I prefer natural processes, but we're also into uh, getting more into washed and some other experimental processes like anaerobics and so on and so forth. And uh, my honestly, the best coffee I've ever had was like in Ethiopia on our first trip there from the Jebina traditional African way of preparing coffee. Uh, the coffee tasted like, uh, it was like key lime pie and chocolate. It was crazy in the middle of like this farm at this lady named Nesru's house. So, but if it's not that, I'm making a pour over, generally on a pour agami, uh, which is like one of the pour over devices we sell and brewing our Guji Man Ethiopian coffee. We're going to do a call out, Anti-Gentrification Coffee Club in Memphis, Tennessee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If anybody's uh, phoning in from Memphis, check it out. For sure. Yeah, it's the place to be, man. It's dope. <laughs> I love it. Well, thank you all for the introduction. And we will likely have one other panelist uh, joining us, uh, a clinician here at Vanderbilt, uh, Peter Martin. And so he should be coming on here shortly. Um, but let's get started with a, a question to really kind of frame this discussion for you, Ted. And could you just talk a little bit about the origins of coffee and where was it first grown and how did it start to gain more global popularity? Well, the most widely cultivated coffee right now is Coffea Arabica is the, is the taxonomic name. And that Linnaeus named it that because he thought that coffee came from the Arabian Peninsula and from what is today Yemen. 
In fact, we know, and Bartholomew and I were just talking about this beforehand, uh, it definitely comes from Ethiopia. We can tell from genetic diversity of existing uh, species and the greatest genetic diversity is in Ethiopia. There's a big argument over exactly where right, that we yeah. were talking about, uh, but it is it is there. And from Ethiopia, it, it jumped over the, uh, the straits there into Yemen and then spread throughout the Muslim world uh, and there, it, controversially, some uh, imam thought that it was an intoxicant, and so it should be banned. And others, especially the Sufis, said, no, it keeps us up so that we can say prayers late at night. Uh, and eventually it won out and really spread across the, 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 Muslim, the Muslim world. Uh, and then eventually to, I don't want to go on too far, but eventually to Europe. Uh, and the Yemenis were able to keep a monopoly on the coffee trade for a few hundred years yeah. until the Dutch smuggled out a seedling and was able to uh, to plant it. And then it really took off in, in Europe after that. Uh, yeah, the 1616, I believe, is when the uh, seeds were stolen by two Dutch spies. So the story goes, it's try, they try to produce it in the Netherlands. Of course, it's a tropical African fruit. It's not going to grow there. And then they go to the island of Java and yeah. colonize those people and force them to grow it. Uh, and that's I, I, actually, ironically, why we call coffee Java today is because of the Javanese people who were enslaved to grow it by the Dutch. So, yeah, that's a really good uh, point. Yeah, it's interesting. But I think a lot of the, 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 the way that coffee has spread has been tied to other cash crops uh, that were a part of like the colonial conquest by Europe and so. Uh, they got into it because of the spice trade. So they were trying to get into, they had a ton of spices already that they were farming and were looking to add to it with coffee. It was super popular at the time. And this is a great illustration of how coffee really mirrors colon Western colonization to Java, yeah. but also to the Caribbean and Central right. America. Well, that's how it gets to the Caribbean is because the, they give, the Dutch give coffee as a gift to yeah. the Emperor of France who then obviously eventually colonizes Haiti and Haiti becomes one of the largest coffee producing countries in the world until the revolution. Uh, so it's fascinating, man, the tie between those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think most, most people don't really know about that. Um, and so how, as a coffee drinking culture and society, a lot of these traditional coffee growers, producers, where coffee originated, there's a large culture and system around coffee. How yeah. can coffee drinkers more appreciate those traditions and cultures and geographies that really is where coffee is from? Uh, and Bartholomew, go ahead. This is your wish. Yeah, I them. think uh, our, our phrase, I got it on the cup here, is love Black people like you love Black coffee. And it's, it's kind of that idea was what was our like founding anthem for what we're doing at Coffee Black. And I think a lot of the ideas that our curiosity around products should extend to the people who produce them. Uh, and unfortunately, one of the effects of capitalism is that you know products become dehumanized and disconnected from the people or the cultures that generate them. And I think in the coffee industry, what I've noticed is that a lot of the curiosity around coffee stopped at the product itself, grind size, water temperature, brew ratio, processing and all that's cool it's fun i self-identify as a coffee nerd so i love that but part of my tradition my faith tradition was that like man you you honor the creator as well as the creation and so i was like yo who made this right what is their belief system around this beyond the way that i'm currently enjoying what can they teach me about how to better enjoy it and that is a part of the long story that led us to ethiopia for our first trip to shoot the documentary and, and build an all-black supply chain and like the people group we connected with specifically uh, is the Oromo people that were there and the folks in the Guji zone. And in the Guji zone, there's a longstanding tradition, uh, you know, 850 BC or so is the date that I received for when they started doing this, but it's called Bunakala, which is a tradition uh, that arose out of the Gata system, which is a democratic uh, system of like engaging with humanity and life and creation and coffee is central to the, to, to the way that people engage in that society. So it affects, it's in, in the coffee ritual is a part of marriage. It's a part of death. It's a part of, you know, birth. It's, it's in daily ritual that people participate in. And within that system arose a belief that coffee was uh, grown from the tears of God and that it was a gift to extend peace between creation and humanity. Long story short, uh, like most people, when they were celebrating, they did a barbecue, right? They would kill an animal, eat the animal, 
but their belief, like, and this is a belief I, I think found in a lot of indigenous communities that there should be harmony between us and creation. They began to look for opportunities on ways to preserve life, including the life of the animal that was being sacrificed. And so when coffee became a part of the society, kala means slaughter. So instead of slaughtering or kala the animal, they believe we could slaughter the coffee, right? This is a gift from the creator to save the life of the animal. And so they began to roast uh, the coffee cherries, they would take a bite out of it and then roast the coffee cherries in the butter from the animal that would have been killed. So I guess technically that's like the world's first bulletproof coffee. Uh, but that scenario has a, a ton of belief systems about how coffee is supposed to be consumed. Almost, kind of, I, I kind of think about it like church, like there's supposed to be reconciliation before we consume communion. So the idea, uh, this blessing came out of it, which is bunafi nagea hendabina which is in Afana Romo. And that blessing means may your house lack no coffee nor peace. Or I kind of think about it as may the peace in your home abound as the coffee flows. But the idea is where there is coffee, there must also be peace. And so inversely then, if there is not peace, right, you have to reconcile before coffee is consumed. Uh, and that belief for us has been very instructional and transformative in how we've integrated coffee into our communities uh, in Memphis and beyond. And I think that there's a lot to learn from perspectives like that. And again, this is the perspective of one ethnic group, one part of one ethnic group. In Ethiopia, I would imagine there's over 80 different ethnic groups in Ethiopia. Coffee is also indigenous to Sudan uh, and other parts of like, Eastern Africa. There's a lot to learn, I think, that didn't get exported when the Dutch took coffee <laughs> out of the port of Mocha in Yemen. And I think that going to learn from those people, asking questions, being curious is the next step in us kind of returning to a more uh, holistic and humanitarian and indigenous perspective on coffee. And if I could jump off of that a little bit, so it creates community, it's crucial to creating community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You are also doing that with your coffee shop in Memphis, creating yeah. community that way. Mm -hmm. And it's also the case that when the Dutch did pick it up, it was not used in that same way, but it started creating a different kind of community. At that time, in the 16 and 1700s, Northern Europeans were drinking about three liters of, albeit low alcohol, but beer a day because it was the safest thing to drink. And then when coffee came onto the scene, it created the space. Coffee shops created the space that were not the church, it was not the state, and it wasn't home. It was this other place for people to get together. And so simultaneously coming out of a centuries-long beer buzz, Having coffee, which is, you know, uh, a focusing a stimulant, focusing concentration. Uh, and, the, and as you mentioned earlier, Aaron, the enlightenment emerged from those coffee shops. And that's not a coincidence, the kind of different sort of community that got created in Europe. Yeah, I would say that it's, it's again, from a faith perspective, that's embedded into the DNA of this plant has a specific design and purpose. I would be curious to learn more about, like, the, the chemical structure of and why it actually creates community. Yeah, uh, and that's perfect, a perfect transition, Bartholomew. We're, we're so happy to have uh, Dr. Peter Martin here. And uh, Peter, could you uh, introduce yourself? And then the first question for you is, is really to go off what Bartholomew was just asking, is if you could talk about some of the main components and chemicals in coffee, how do they impact the human body and what makes it different from other drugs? Well, uh, I'm so glad to be with you. It, it took me about uh, 25, 30 minutes to get on. <laughs> There's the connection was, uh, I, I mean, I think it was odd. I think part of it is VUMC, Vanderbilt, uh, the, the, the email systems are kind of mixed up at this point. But at any rate, uh, I am, um, you know, I've been in this field for uh, probably since the uh, mid 1990s, when I was approached by, well, there's a very interesting story in terms of how I got into it. Uh, what happened was that uh, the, in the 1990s, the cost of coffee was going down tremendously precipitously. And countries in South America were going bankrupt. Interestingly enough, Vanderbilt has such a large reputation in pharmacology that one of the scientists from Brazil contacted me and, and you know, tried to convince me that coffee was good for your health. And um, everything I had read in the literature at that time, 
as, as a physician was that coffee was harmful. It caused cancer, it caused heart disease, it caused this, that, and the other. And um, then I started reading the literature and it became very clear that the bad news about coffee was probably related to bad science. And in fact, what they were looking at is people tend to, in the old days, they would smoke cigarettes, drink coffee, drink, uh, you, know, you know, associated coffee with all kinds of bad behaviors. And if you factor out statistically what is contributing, what coffee is doing and what the other lifestyle variables are doing, it becomes very clear that coffee actually is protective. Coffee is healthful. And so uh, we started the Institute for Coffee Studies uh, with funding from uh, the coffee producing countries. And I said right up front that uh, I'm interested in trying to understand how coffee may be beneficial, not that it's ha not harmful and that kind of stuff. And it became very clear that coffee has many, many com constituents not only caffeine, as most people would say, but also we uncovered uh, compounds such as chlorogenic acids and many, many other compounds. Remember, this is a natural, uh, this is a plant. And in the plant, there are hundreds and hundreds of components. And these components, some of them are extremely beneficial. And if I got incorrectly in, in the discussion we were talking about, African-Americans drinking coffee or starting to drink coffee. And I think, I think that's, that's uh, Bartholomew, that's a brilliant idea because one of the things that have, has been demonstrated over the last 30 years is that coffee is very protective, has compounds in it that are protective against type two diabetes and coronary artery disease. And a lot of the illnesses that affect the African-American community for example, diabetes is 60% um, more common in African Americans than it is in, in, uh, uh, in white Americans and uh, black Americans versus white Americans. And uh, so I think coffee is ideally made for the black American uh, in terms of its healthful properties. Um, there are now over, uh, you know, over 30 studies that have demonstrated that coffee consumption is protective against type two diabetes. And the other thing that's very important is that decaffeinated coffee can also be protective. Interesting, that's so interesting. Bartholomew, uh, Peter really brought up one of your missions. Could you speak to your mission about growing coffee when consumption? I, for sure, when I got into kind of specialty coffee, like I said, coffee was in my church, coffee was in our house. Uh, my dad was really into Kenyan coffee growing up. He did like a study abroad program with Lemoyne Owen and like came back passionate about all things Kenyan and eventually got into Kenyan coffee. But I, I hated coffee growing up. I thought it was gross. Uh, I think anything that was, but like any coffee drink that didn't include coffee was kind of my, my better, like I told you about the Trappuccino, Starbucks, strawberry Frappuccino, like no <laughs> coffee involved in what I was doing. Uh, and a lot of that wasn't the coffee's fault, right? It was the processes that the coffee I was drinking had been put through, the quality of the coffee I was receiving. Uh, we all are familiar with the term of like a food desert, but a lot of the communities I was growing in were, were coffee deserts, right? The quality of coffee that was available was very poor. Uh, and I think a lot of that was because of the quality of food in general that was available in our community. So when I went to college at Wheaton College, uh, I got in kind of the shadow of intelligentsia and became very curious about coffee. Long story short, you know, I began to kind of nerd out on it and I would try to bring, I was an elementary education major, so I would bring students I was mentoring, I was a rapper, so I'd bring other rappers or friends that I have who were from my community to coffee shops and, you know, try to get them to enjoy it and discover what I had discovered, try to bring some of the pre preconceptions, misconceptions that I had incorrectly held about what coffee is and even where it's from, right? Like at that point, I thought coffee was Italian, French, maybe South American in origin, mm -hmm. did not know anything about this like long pre-colonial history of coffee that existed in Ethiopia and Sudan and so on and so forth. Uh, and when I would try to share that with people I knew, 
oftentimes they were interested in the idea of coffee being African in origin, the idea of coffee being something that was more than just a bitter burnt beverage to get you through long nights. But in many ways, like people weren't able to get past kind of the cultural trappings of most coffee shops. And we're all familiar with coffee being seen as one of the four horsemen of the gentrification apocalypse, you know, next to Whole Foods, craft breweries and small ladies walking smaller dogs. So a lot of my friends were like, hey, I'm just to be honest, this is some white folks stuff. I'm not coming in the shop. Right. And so I was used to code switching. I was used to being in spaces where I was kind of a minority. But a lot of the peers that I was mentoring in the schools I was teaching at or people I grew up with weren't willing to do that. So we said, well, what is the environment we can put coffee in that would give people a safe space to be curious? And so that mm -hmm. led to Coffee Black as a project. And we kind of started out with the question of do Black, do black people drink coffee? Uh, and of course, I'm black people were the first people to drink coffee, <laughs> right? So the answer to that is obviously yes. Uh, but then also like we found that there were a lot of people in our community who were curious about coffee but kind of felt like the spaces where coffee was being curated, especially third wave coffee, weren't for them. And so our project has been aimed at trying to increase consumption among African-Americans by providing an African context, we call it a culturally congruent experience in coffee. But the research right now says that African-Americans are twice as least likely to choose coffee as their beverage of choice compared to other ethnic groups within America. Uh, but what we have found is that when the music is right, the vibe is right, the history is correct, the roasting is immaculate, that a lot of people find that coffee becomes something that they never knew that they would love. And the unintended health benefits of that, I think, are also really fascinating because inadvertently we're also introducing people to some of the best coffee on the planet, right? Really high quality, specialty grade coffee, which is a huge contrast to the Folgers or the Bustelo or the community coffee that most of our communities have access to here in the States. That's a great illustration. So this the health benefits that Peter was pointing out and bringing that to the African-American population, but it's not just a public health project. It's a political project and a mm -hmm. cultural project as well, which is a nice illustration of how coffee works that yeah. way, mm -hmm. that coffee brings all of these things together. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just wanted to do a follow up point to what Peter was saying earlier and underline that when Peter started this research in the early 2000s, as he said, people saw coffee as a detriment to health. And it was really the research that started here that emerged. And now we see coffee in a very different way. And I love the public health language around this. There was an article in the New England Journal of Medicine not long ago that drinking up to five cups of coffee a day is negatively correlated with all cause mortality. So the more coffee you drink, the less you die. The first cup definitely feels like the first cup of life in the morning. So. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that I, research I, I, started. Uh, here, it's, there's it's, a theme here. And, you know, when we first started the Institute for Coffee Studies, our focus was, was purely biomedical. And then um, it was very clear to me that coffee was a lot more than just molecules. It had... Uh, it had a lot of social, political, economic implications. And um, it has, uh, the Institute has, has blossomed over the last um, uh, two and a half decades into, into one that uh, does the sort of things that, that, that Ted does. And um, let me just underline, you talked about food deserts and I think it's really important to take the, you know, the allegory a little further, and that is, coffee is actually a food. Mm. Okay, and 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 in African, in in, in black neighborhoods, there are uh, food deserts, and one of the components of that food desert is coffee. Yeah, and um, access to coffee is is going to be very beneficial, I think, to the entire community. So. Mm. So I really that, like what Bartholomew is, is is trying to accomplish. I think to that point, like the anti-gentrification coffee club really started as a joke. Uh, our neighborhood is facing gentrification like many others. You know, the city made an announcement they're putting seven million at an intersection in our community. And one of my neighbors kept asking me, you know, as we were building the company at the time, we were just kind of roasting shipping out of our house. And um, he was like, man, you guys should do something 
in the neighborhood. And I was like, no, it's gonna it's gonna invite all the gentrifiers <laughs> to our neighborhood. Like I don't want to do that. But it kind of made me think, well, what would it look like if coffee shops were not just a place where we served a product from black and brown communities, but it also could be for them too. Uh, and who we hire and who we source from and the aesthetics and the art we choose and the fact that we accept cash. I mean, there's a lot of things that you can go into it. What, what makes something an anti-gentrification coffee club? And to some extent, we're figuring that out. Um, but one of the things that's been dope has been roasting in our neighborhood, right? And my wife is our coffee roaster. We have an all black supply chain. And part of that is the, we do a yearly internship uh, called the SIT program where young African-Americans are able to come and learn about the coffee industry and like, it's been such a beautiful thing to see. We say all the time, coffee is the African fruit. It should taste like it. And um, like one of the things that's so beautiful is seeing people actually realize coffee is the seed of an African fruit. It often gets contextualized as a bean, which is weird to me as a kid whose grandma grew, like, grew up in Alabama. I grew up like hulling peas on her farm. Peas and beans come in pods. This is the seed of a tropical African cherry. I'm kind of confused at how this is a bean, but a lot of our community thinks about coffee as a bean, and there's just so many other misconceptions about it. Them actually getting to put their hands on the green coffee and seeing, oh, this actually looks like, you know, a seed. And then being able to see, oh, it gets roasted. That's how it becomes brown. And then you grind it. That's how it's able to become the substance that most of us, that's the form most of us are familiar with when we get introduced to coffee and how empowering that is. And I think how, how, how tied it is back to what we were talking about in the beginning of like this colonial trauma of colonial cash crops. Right. And so for a lot of the African, African American community, and I found in conversations with other members of the African diaspora is true for other colonized communities. Like there's a trauma around the relationship between like the people and the land. Right. And agriculture. Mm -hmm. And like there's a lot of trauma associated with being a person who picks things from the ground. Right. And I kind of asked the question, like, how much would you have to pay me for my children to pick cotton? Right. Th there isn't a number. Mm -hmm you could offer mm -hmm. me, it's not an economic question first for me, it's a dignity, it's a, it's a humanitarian question for me, it's a theological question of like, what is my children's purpose and being associated with this crop has a trauma associated with it. And as we've engaged with this work, we found like, wow, okay, we're not working with cotton, but we are working with something that's picked from the ground, grown in the ground. And there's a healing aspect of like finding a pre-colonial relationship with the ground and with nature and with food that's grown from the ground and seeing people who look like us in a dignified form and honoring them in that work has been very healing. And then to extend the project, last year we went on a world tour, a screening tour for our documentary, Coffee Black to Africa. We screened it all around the US. We screened it in Ethiopia for the prime minister's brother. We screened it in Rwanda for a group of coffee farmers and baristas. And we found that this kind of other story of coffee other than the one that many countries have experienced with coffee being a product that's just kind of drop off, hey, you grow this or else, right? But see, there's a whole history of like communities forming beautiful relationships, spiritual relationships, familial bonds around coffee, that it heals the, the kind of the sociological narrative conversation around coffee, right? It begins to give them the space to be curious culinarily and scientifically about the beverage as like a medicine of, of sorts or the beverage as a food that can be consumed to improve. And we found that like, you kind of have to remove those psychological barriers first before you can get into more of the biological and chemical opportunities that exist within coffee as a drink. And um, I think that just speaks to like coffee as it is. Like it's, it's always been more than just a beverage. As a beverage, it's truly fascinating. Um, but I think that you can't disconnect Kind of the the anthropological conversation from the biological conversation yeah I, I agree and just real real quickly ted bartholomew you've mentioned this documentary a few times in passing could you just talk about the title and what it is oh yeah so it's coffee black to africa uh it's the it's a documentary kind of showing our journey uh, coming from memphis and learning about pre-colonial coffee culture and then bringing that information from the communities we met in ethiopia people like mike memo ture waji uh, Tom Maru, who's the lead farmer for the coffee that uh, we sell in the form of Guji Main uh, from the Guji zone of Ethiopia. Um, all of that, bringing that journey back to Memphis, uh, to the Anti-Gentrification Coffee Club to share. And kind of the background is when we started the project of the Anti-Gentrification Coffee Club, I took a month off of social media. And for background, our company had been, it is primarily an e-commerce company. And so we started in the pandemic, hosting, shipping, doing content podcasts, releasing music, um, 
content on social media. When we started the Anti-Gentrification Coffee Club, it was important. A part of my faith practice is this idea of being incarnational. And so like, we live in our neighborhood after I graduated from grad school. My wife and I decided we wanted to move back into our neighborhood to be a resource for our community, to mentor, to live, to work, to go to church, all that in the same space. And so uh, when we started the cafe, I was like, I want to be here. And so I had to get off social media. I took a month and just like talk to my community, serve coffee, did all the preconceived there's all these preconceived notions about what coffee is and where it's from and who it's for and why it's bad right. and a lot even the idea of like don't drink coffee it makes you black like that's an old wives tale in the african-american community mm -hmm. and the idea of why wouldn't you want to be black right but there's this yeah. conception with being blacker and all of the trauma associated with that from slavery and so on and so forth i spent time i was just in the community serving coffee telling the story of the farmers we're partnering with and at that time, I hadn't been to Ethiopia yet, and people kept asking me, like, like yo, wh when are you going to go to Africa? And I'm like, that's a wild question to just ask somebody, like, have you been to Africa? Like, of course I haven't been to Africa. No African-American I knew have been to Africa. Like, it's kind of a, uh, you know, that's a dream. It's a Marcus Garvey fairy tale, almost. And so I was like, I, I, I don't have money for that. I'm trying to get a business off the ground. You got three kids. You know, I just quit my teaching job. Like, I don't have opportunities to do that. But people kept asking me and they kind of pushed me to say, what's the possibility here? So, you know, I called my mentors and they all said, try it. So I put a GoFundMe out for, you know, funds to go on this trip and, and shoot the documentary. I grossly underestimated, underestimated how much money it took <laughs> to do a documentary. But to, to that point, we raised $24,000 in 72 hours uh, and people from all around the world donated. We went, we shot the documentary. I had to raise a bunch more money to finish the documentary. And uh, last year we won Best Film in Coffee. And so we've been able to kind of share this documentary. I kind of call it like an anti-PBS doc. Like there are coffee documentaries out there, but my contacts remember is I, I teach, I taught English to middle schoolers. So if it, was, if it wasn't something my middle, my middle schools would watch, I'm like, then it's kind of pointless for us with our project. Because if it's this old kind of in the field, <laughs> there's one, like nobody that I know is going to watch that. And so we did all the music for the documentary. We did an original soundtrack with producers who were part of the Anti-Gentrification Coffee Club and um, really made it more as a collage doc, a multimedia piece. Uh, there's music, mm -hmm. it's a part music video, part interview, part blog, part, you know, it's all part archival footage. Um, and so we shot, you know, a bunch of Super 8 footage, 800 film photos, um, the whole thing. And it's been a really dope experience. And to that point, it's been a great way to kind of like remove a lot of the misconceptions around coffee and once people see it it opens them up to kind of have a true experience with coffee that's not shaded by a lot of the sugar and cream that's been added into our idea of what coffee is and what it can be hmm. well, thank you and ted you were going to say something so i apologize but no uh i was just going to going back to sort of the the science theme of our session today coffee is really interesting and one thing that comes out in the documentary there's a lot of art that goes into processing at harvest. Mm -hmm. You have to process coffee in very particular kinds of ways. As the cherry rots, there are enzymatic reactions that happen that change the flavor. But unlike many other agricultural products, there's also an equally crucial processing that takes place at the point of consumption. So mm -hmm. Bartholomew's uh, wife is the roaster there. And roasting also has these super complicated chemical reactions that change the flavor of the coffee. So you have these scientific processes going mm -hmm. on at both ends, unlike wine or most other uh most other and then after it's roasted like there's almost like a, another equally difficult part i wouldn't say it's really? equally as difficult as farming because trying to get up the hills in ethiopia i had like oh ethiopian grandma is laughing me so that's that's the hardest part is definitely on the farm but brewing coffee correctly is an art and it's a challenge and if it's not brewed correctly it can skew someone's perception of the beverage as a whole I bet you were drinking percolator coffee at church. Oh, when you were yeah, growing up. it was terrible. <laughs> terrible. The brew ratio was off. Like it sat in there for hours and hours. I, mean, I don't even want to get into it, but it was, it was pretty bad. Yeah. No, it's amazing how especially coffee has changed things. And we'll get back to that. But I wanted to ask another question about the health benefits. And just from my own family member's perspective, one of my family members has liver disease and their doctor is actually prescribed uh, coffee as a additional intervention to help uh, with healing of the liver. And could you speak a little bit more, Peter, to other benefits uh, of, of yeah. coffee? And are there any known uh, side effects or or things that people should know about? 
Well, let me begin by saying that I personally don't know of any harmful effects that have been demonstrated. I mean, that have been categorically demonstrated. But there are some very impressive beneficial effects. Uh, my interest in it is I'm what I'm an addiction psychiatrist, and I'm very interested in in. Um, I made a very in the, the initial observation was, isn't it interesting that patients or people in AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, tend to drink a lot of coffee? Is it is it simply because uh, you know they can't drink anything else, and so they drink coffee? They displace their desire to have something in their mouth. Um, when I looked into this more carefully, it was very clear that uh, there was a relationship between uh, the amount of coffee people drank and how problematic their alcoholism was. Uh, possibly, uh, possibly coffee had components in it which were protective against alcoholism. The point that you made, Aaron, was about the liver. Initially, when that study was, uh, you know, those effects on the liver were identified, they were in people who were alcoholic. They had uh, less cirrhosis, less deaths from cirrhosis and from liver cancer, the ones who drank coffee. So that's where it sort of began, the notion that coffee had in it compounds that, uh, that combat reactive oxygen species formed by the process of the cell living, it makes toxins. You know, living is not, living involves generating toxins. And what coffee has in it are components which actually fight these reactive oxygen species. And that's the idea behind its protective effects in the liver. There are also protective effects demonstrated for heart attacks and coronary art artery disease. Uh, there are effects uh, reducing the rates of suicide. And of course, I, being a psychiatrist, felt that the reason people commit suicide is because of depression. And in fact, there are some antidepressant effects of coffee. Um, so uh, the, there are, uh, I didn't mention Alzheimer's disease. That's probably next to type two diabetes, the one that's been most well demonstrated. And as I may have said, uh, that some of the compounds that we identified in coffee are now being scientifically developed potentially as a way to treat Alzheimer's disease. So I want you to look at the, the course of things. We began with, a failing, with failing economies in South America who come to us because we are experts in pharmacology saying, let's find out why coffee is good for you. We identify compounds in coffee, which act on fundamental molecular processes involved in living. There are also a whole series of epidemiologic studies, the, the new epidemiologic studies, not the old kind, which showed that coffee causes cancer, but the new kind, which factors in all the lifestyle variables that are associated and demonstrate that coffee has these definite beneficial effects on liver disease, on heart disease, on diabetes, on depression, possibly on addiction, possibly on obesity. So now we're covering a very tremendous, you know, very broad uh, area of all the medical problems mankind encounters that affect our society. And in fact, the question becomes, you know, the question I always get asked, is coffee addictive? 
And I'm an addiction psychiatrist, as I said, and one of my big interests is how coffee is different from the drugs that are very prevalent in all communities, but the African-American communities. And, and, and how is it that, that is, is coffee a drug? Well, the way I answer that question is, when do you know anyone who's actually destroyed his family, left his wife, uh, robbed a bank in order to get money for coffee? I don't know anyone who's ever done that. So actually coffee has some uh, dependence qualities the, the brain adapts to coffee, but it's not the kind of rewarding effect that you get from cocaine or from opioids. You know, it's, it's not like alcohol. It's actually more akin to being a food. And as a food, it's something that's really, really beneficial. In our studies, we, we did an epidemiologic study, which was sort of half epidemiologic, you know, you know, half, half medical and half anthropologic. Ted was part of it. That was our, our first collaboration where we looked at AA members. And we also looked at when they started drinking coffee and when they started smoking cigarettes and when they started drinking alcohol. And interestingly enough, in our society, they start smoking cigarettes first, then drinking alcohol, and then finally mm. drinking mm. coffee. Wow. And the question is that parents, parents look at coffee as being something dangerous for their kids. And if you look at, go across the world and you look at Europe, in Europe, kids start drinking coffee when they're seven or eight. Could that result in lower rates of other psychiatric problems, lower rates of alcoholism, lower rates of smoking marijuana, lower rates of, of opioid addiction. Uh, these are some of these, or a lot of these are still open questions, but I submit that coffee is actually very good for our society and may be protective against not just these medical illnesses like type two diabetes and, and coronary artery disease, but also against uh, depression and uh, also uh, developing addictions, real addictions, ones that people rob banks for, kill their wives, those kinds of things. Mm. So uh, I hope that sort of covers the waterfront. Yeah, that, that's uh, you super. may have some more questions. Aaron, may, I may not have covered everything. No, that's 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 a, a great overview for I think there's so many misconceptions still about the health benefits or or what people think are adversities. And I'd like to get back to the idea of how has specialty coffee changed the narrative? How has it opened up more dialogue about culture, about understanding the history? Um, and Ted and Bartholomew, could you speak to that a little bit? And then after that, I think I'd really love to hear your thoughts on what is the ethical considerations in this specialty coffee world that people should think about when they're choosing coffees or choosing coffee shops? Well, one thing that it, uh, Peter's comments made me think about, <clears throat> his work and others have shown that coffee is healthy for us. One thing that specialty coffee has been interested in is how to make sure that it's not unhealthy for the people who are producing it. Uh, because it is it is historically a very low wage, uh, originally uh, uh, labor by enslaved peoples, uh, and then sort of a poster child for poor neo-colonial kinds of labor relations. So that's one of the interests. And uh, I'll get the ball rolling and hand it off to Bartholomew. But just by saying, in the coffee world, we often talk about there being three waves. And the first wave is like Folgers and Maxwell House and, and supermarket commodity coffee. The second wave came along in the 80s and 90s here in Nashville, places like Bongo Java, and then nationally, I guess, sort of Starbucks amping up the level. And then lately, we've had what are called third wave coffee shops. And in that movement, it's been an interest in what are these different flavors that coffee can have? 
and so like Folgers and Starbucks, it's like what I call coffee, coffee flavor, kind of earthy, chocolatey, mm -hmm. down to earth. What's really popular these days and what Bartholomew is really great at roasting uh, is natural coffees, East African natural coffees, where the cherry is allowed to rot off the bean and it creates these <laughs> and citrus and fruity notes that when I first tasted it, I thought this isn't good coffee because it tastes so weird. Yeah. But then when you start to see, wow, coffee can be made to have all these different flavor profiles. So when we talk about specialty coffee these days, what we really mean is this explosion in different flavors that people can experience in coffee. And I would say in addition to that, I think almost coupled to that, in addition to like the culinary proposition, you bring this out in your book, right? So I'm kind of saying you up here, but like, there's also a moral proposition I think that comes with it. And there's this idea that coffee should not just be good, it should be good for the people who grow it, right? And so there's this idea that the better the coffee tastes, the better it must be for the people who grew it, because the assumption is they're having better conditions, they're better able to produce it and farm it and harvest it. And so therefore they're receiving a higher quality product. And though that can be true at times, Right, it, it oftentimes is not. And I think um, that reality is a part of what we began to see first in my community. Like I started noticing that many of the coffee shops that were popping up in communities where black and brown people live that I was around, like did not have any black and brown people inside of the shops. And so uh, though I was having this really interesting, very nerdy culinary experience, getting into these different flavor profiles and processes for brewing it and learning about how it was prepared, there was very little culturally that would identify this product as something that was first discovered in African communities and then grown around the world in black and brown communities. Like there was very little of that culture present besides like a very long description on the bag and then some notes about, you know, where how high the elevation was. And so I began to say like, what would it look like again for a society not just to love single origin coffee, but also single origin people, right? And that led us to this the project uh, of kind of taking, people kind of call what we do fourth wave coffee. Some people say it's fifth wave coffee. I'm not particularly interested in the waves. I always say as long as nobody drowns, I don't care what wave we're in. Um, but I think the idea that, that coffee should be, it has kind of like a moral obligation associated to it. I think is is you could say is unique to the third wave or specialty coffee movement, maybe second wave, but like fair trade, I guess. But to that point, I think specialty coffee has has been trying to continually iterate on what that I is. And, and I don't identify as necessarily a specialty coffee professional. I'm an outsider. I'm from Memphis, Tennessee. My dad is a preacher. My mom is a teacher. I was a rapper. Like that, I'm kind of outside of the specialty coffee conversation that was happening in Seattle and Portland and LA and even New York or Chicago. But I got kind of thrown into it by virtue of proximity and gentrification. And so having been in this space for the last eight to seven years or so, I found that like there's a lot more work to do for the proposition of specialty coffee, the moral proposition anyway, to actually hold true to what people say it is. And, and to that point, I think it is important for us to reconcile with that because there's, there, there can be dishonesty if we continue as we are, because the idea that this coffee is not only better tasting, but better for the people who grow it, is a part of the reason that roasters use to justify exorbitantly high prices on the coffee they're selling. Like the idea is, hey, you pay me more for coffee, I can do more good for farmers. And to that point, I think that oftentimes, unfortunately, that is not always the case. And I brought up with Ted the conversation. I noticed some some things happening on Twitter uh, with like issues surrounding the harvest in Ethiopia, and I saw roasters kind of complaining about you know the coffee not cupping. If you're not familiar with cupping. Uh, cupping is kind of like the, the coffee equivalent of a sommelier, right? Like coffee is kind of given this score from zero to 100. I saw people complaining like that the scores weren't as high as they were in previous years. And so unfortunately, they wouldn't have an Ethiopian coffee on their menu. And I just commented like, that's, that's strange to me. It's, it's just not, again, as an outsider from the coffee industry, I'm from music. When I make a commitment to work with a producer, and we call coffee produ coffee farmers producers, right? If I make a commitment to a producer, that commitment doesn't go away when they fall on hard times. In fact, in, in my community, the idea is when people are suffering, you strengthen your commitment with them. That's a part of what being a real person entails, of being honest, of having integrity. And in the coffee industry, I saw people saying things like, oh, the coffee is a coming aside, so we're not buying it this year. I was like, that's when you need to buy it the most. 
That's when those yeah. farmers are dealing with things like famine and war and drought. Like those farmers need you to purchase this harvest the most. In fact, maybe we could pay more this year to see how we can help or we can assist uh, with what's going on on the ground. And I think when we're selling this coffee at a high point and we're telling people pay more because I'm helping farmers and then the farmers actually need help and all of a sudden we don't buy the coffee anymore. There's a bit of like intellectual dishonesty there. Okay. I think your book really brings out a lot of that from what you, you saw in Guatemala. Thanks, man. Yeah. Uh, I, it, this feels odd. Uh, Bartholomew is putting in all the sociology that I I, I would normally do, yeah. and I'm pulling it. I thought we might mention just briefly for people who would be interested, going into a specialty coffee shop these days can be a little bit confusing to consumers. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so a couple of things to look out for. There are two main, most of the coffee in a coffee specialty shop is going to be of the species Coffea arabica. Every once in a while, you'll see a Robusta or a Liberica, but mostly Coffea arabica. Within that, there are two main processes, washed and natural. The washed coffees produce more of a chocolatey, traditional coffee flavor, mm -hmm. and the naturals more of this floral, citrusy thing. So for those of you who are looking to expand your coffee horizons, next time you go into a specialty shop and looking at the menu, look at that washed and natural, and maybe try one of those naturals and go for some of the, the more exotic flavors. Yeah, for sure. I, I think the naturally processed coffees, I mean, it's called natural because in a lot of ways, this is the way coffee gets processed in Ethiopia. People would place the coffee cherries on like tin roofs. And this also, you see this a lot in Yemen. Um, they would place it on tin roofs. Obviously, water is not a plentiful resource in a lot of these communities. So the coffee would just dry there and the sugars would caramelize and, you know, it would produce a really interesting flavor once the husk was removed from the seed. Uh, because a lot of those natural fruit, fl fruit flavors were infused in the coffee. And I do love like a lot of the culinary explanation. People are borrowing processes from the wine industry, carbonic maceration, anaerobic coffees, fruit infused coffees, which is kind of interesting because I thought for a while we didn't like flavored coffees. <laughs> and now everyone's throwing cinnamon sticks and mangoes inside of like these like the chemical, <laughs> these chemical baths where the coffee is being uh, fermented. But I think it's it's fun and it's interesting and I love all the exploration that's possible there as a nerd, like anime, comic books, like this stuff just kind of stimulates my mind. And so I, I enjoy it. I think that what I hope happens is that our curiosity around the product, again, extends to our curiosity about the people, right? And their lives and their circumstances and what they're going through. And that's why we say love black people like you love black coffee. Uh, because like the idea of taking something for as it as it is, as God created with no additives needed, is I think something that at the end of the day, all human beings deserve, especially those who produce a beverage that is like the, the most consumed liquid on the planet yeah. after after water. You know, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's only befitting to those people. Yeah. yeah, no, thank you so much for that. And uh, we've been trying to integrate uh, questions from the audience throughout, but we're going to get to a few more of their their questions. And one of the there's a few for you, Peter. Uh, specifically, there's some thoughts that coffee and caffeine specifically can exacerbate certain heart issues. Is that the case? And is that where you're talking about decaf, that that's really the way to yeah. go? That's a really good question. It was thought uh, for a long time that caffeine was, uh, you know, cause your heart to beat faster and it's going to be bad for your heart. Um, you know, and I think I think you should, what I always say to patients is check with your doctor. You know, I, I, I think I know, but I don't know your history. But in general, um, uh, there is no evidence to suggest that coffee consumption, and this is full coffee, has any risk for heart disease. Um, and, and I think that uh, there has been data showing that caffeine per se is not bad for your heart. But some people might have unusual, unusual problems with the rhythm of their heart, and they should check with their doctors. But it, coffee should not be stopped because you have heart disease, mostly. Thank you. And then one other. Could, could I could I add just a yeah. point? And this is I'm I'm recapitulating stuff that I've heard Peter say before. And so when he was saying the decaf and stuff, it's really these chlorogenic acids and caffeonic acids and these other compounds that are are preventative against these things. Correct me if I'm wrong, Peter. And that's well, the reason why. Yeah, yeah. 
No, I think, uh, I think you can do instant point. coffee or decaf or yeah. really fancy coffee. So let me let me just suggest that uh, people make a big mistake when they say coffee equals caffeine. Coffee has caffeine in it, but it has thousands of other compounds. And as Ed was, as Ted was saying, uh, most likely the beneficial effects are not really caffeine, although some some of the beneficial effects of coffee, for example, for Parkinson's disease has been suggested due to, due to caffeine. But in general, the beneficial effects are not the caffeinate, are not caffeine. And uh, that's kind of important. But, but I think that, that, that people sort of say, I have heart disease, I can't drink coffee because the caffeine makes me wired and all that kind of thing. And that's what I hear most often. And I think the, the data show that that's not true. One of the other big questions, one more medical question, then we'll get to a closing question, is about how does coffee interact with IBS and Crohn's, or is it connected to acid reflux or things like that? So how does it connect with the gut and how does it connect in that way? Yeah, it can cause acid reflux. And, um, you know, there are ways of sort of preventing it by, you know, sort of drinking it, not at night, but earlier on in the day. There is some research ongoing to make special formulations of coffee that are less or more gut friendly. But, but you know, uh, some people do get, do get irritable bowel. But irritable bowel is present for a whole variety of reasons. And uh, sometimes to equate it with coffee is, is, is premature for an individual. Yeah. Let me just say, because, you know, I haven't had a chance to, to mention this. This is kind of important and it ties together with the different forms of coffee. Um, it's really important to, to note that the preparation of the coffee can actually influence the concentration of the beneficial components in the coffee. We did research which showed that a lot of these compounds when, when the roasting starts, they go up in concentration, but if the roasting continues, then they are broken down by the heat from the coffee, from the roasting. So it's very important, uh, you know, if you have a choice, take moderately roasted coffee or lightly roasted coffee rather than heavily roasted coffee. Uh, incidentally, heavy, heavily roasted coffee also interferes with the flavor of the coffee. So if you want to have fine coffee, don't have, have, don't have uh, greatly roasted coffee, have moderately roasted coffee. Yeah, I think and then the last point, which I think is very important and, that, and the audience needs to hear, I'm often asked what coffee is best for my health? And I all, all, my answer typically is drink coffee but drink it black without sugar or without all the kinds of emollients that people give put into coffee because those are typically fat and carbohydrates and they're not good for your health. It's coffee, pure coffee, black coffee. That's black. I, like that. I like that. That's the one that's healthful. And uh, the last question is, I'm often asked, how much coffee can I drink, doctor? And my answer is drink all you want, as long as you can sleep at night. If you can't sleep at night, cut back your last cup of coffee of the day and keep on cutting back until you can sleep at night because sleep is every bit as important as coffee is. Mm -hmm. But coffee does an awful lot of good, but if it interferes with your sleep, it's doing, doing more harm than good. That's a really important point. And uh, we'll close out with, with this question. I, I'd just like to give this to everybody. Uh, what would you like people, what is the most important thing you'd like people to take away, either the societal, economic, or environmental impacts, health impacts of coffee that we may not have covered today or that you want to really hit home? And we'll start with Ted, go to Bartholomew, and then end with Peter. Uh, I, my point would be a point that Bartholomew has already made. Uh, there's a wonderful world of new coffees out there to explore, and I would encourage everybody to do it. But don't confuse paying a high price for coffee with thinking that it is fairly uh, compensated throughout the whole supply chain. 
for sure. Uh, man, I, I would just say like, uh, be curious uh, and extend your curiosity beyond the product and extend that towards the people. Uh, coffee is $495 billion industry, according to the president of Uganda. Uh, African countries uh, receive less than 1% of that, about $2 billion. Even though coffee was discovered in Africa, all the 130 species of coffee are indigenous to the African continent only. Um, and coffee was grown in mass because of the contributions of African slaves alongside that of indenture uh, or indigenous peoples. Um, I think that there's a lot of work to do with coffee, but I also think there's a lot of potential for good. And I would, I think if we, if we stay curious about the people and keep those people in our forefront as we enjoy the product, uh, there's an opportunity for us to create the world we want to see. Thank you. And Peter. I guess I would say that uh, coffee is a food that's good for your health and we would be a lot better off if people started drinking uh, black coffee early on in life instead of sugared uh, soft drinks thank you so much i like this guy and thank you so much everyone for attending today we saw we couldn't get to all the questions we had a lot submitted both in registration and today but we're excited to Share this conversation will be posted on YouTube and we'll follow up via email uh, early next week with some links, especially to the documentary, to Ted's book, um, and look forward to y'all taking part in more dialogue about coffee. So thank you so much. And please join us in the future for Lab to Table. Hope everyone has a great day. Thank you. everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.